I'd like to welcome each one of you tonight to this uh, session about small carvings. And the only difference between small carvings and large carvings is the word. It simply is a matter of uh, looking a little bit smaller and using a little bit less wood. And it's become a joy for me personally to be involved in this. And as I take part in different shows, different places across our province, and even online, the small seems to attract people. They want to come and see it. They've seen carvings of all different sorts, but small is not something that has been part of their situation. And so as I do that, I'm going to start first by doing a share screen. And we're going to go to a PowerPoint today. If I can find just the right one. So one of the sayings that I uh, came across in recent times is nothing measures up to the excitement and discovery of peeling away layers of wood, exposing hidden treasures in the grain and texture and color. This fellow is a wood turner, but it sure applies to the uh, carvers as well. We don't always know what's inside of that little block of wood or even that great big block of wood when you take a chainsaw to it. <clears throat> And carving small, the miniature world, uh, as I share that tonight, uh, I've discovered this by way of the fact that when I'm uh, 13 years ago, when I retired, I had a dream that I was going to like, to, I wanted to start a wood carving business and make it uh, a possibility for lots of people to see it. And that meant getting out into the community. So I did different things. They attracted different people. But when I came across one kind of thing, and that was the world of fairies. You cannot believe how many people are interested in the fairy world and all it applies to fairies. So as I started to carve little houses, uh, smaller things, some of the carvings were maybe two, three, four inches tall. And one of the lavender farms not far away from Peterborough here, she was interested in fairy things and wondered if I would come down sometime and show my fairies villages off and fairy houses. That led to a relationship now that's been going for about 12 years. I built a fairy village underneath of the uh, two apple trees that they have there. And it has been just a real joy to be a part of uh, the uh, things that we uh, are doing. Now the screen shows me sitting behind my table and uh, that's at uh, the Niagara Falls show one year. And on that table, I have lots of stuff. Some people said, you bring that all the time to these shows. I said, yes, every Wednesday in Peterborough in downtown mall, through an arrangement with one of the local stores, they've invited me to come and be a part of their, uh, the mall experience. And we're there to help people to know what carving's about. Then one person joined me, another person joined me. And pretty soon we had up to five people there. And on that table, there's lots of things. I bring them to carving shows as well as to my uh, programs that I do during the midweek here. That was before March 2020. But on the table, there's lots of little things. I'm going to show you some of those pictures that right now just to, that we have on that table. There's one of the uh, areas on my table. I have some boots. These are Dutch shoes up above. And then my cowboy boots. Uh, some of the uh, comfort birds that I do are here. I said it, but I didn't write it. And then to have over here is some real small boots. You see another part of the, the dis table display, the different kind of broken, old broken the work boots. I have some high heel shoes with uh, chicken feet on it. Some of you have seen those. But then I started going smaller. And you see this area right down here with the pointers uh, working over it, down to these little tiny guys at the end. Well, somebody said, how in the world do you do that? First off, taking a piece of pine or basswood or whatever, and you have it on a stick, you carve the boot on the end of it, and then you take the boot off after to finish it. Carving small goes from the larger Santa Clauses. Some of the magazines, or one of the magazines, I had these um, snowmen in the front of it. Some people have tried to carve those. But then we went smaller. I just kept going a little bit smaller. Somebody could, you, you have a small snowman. Well, here's the quarter at the side, this little guy. Now, you can see the problem with small sometimes. Painting is difficult, but the fortunate part about it is when it's small and held away from your face, you don't always see all the details kind of messed up. On this one, as the camera's a little closer, I filled up the 
carved area where the mouth was and the cheeks. I went back and tried to burn it and I had a problem because the burn then scorched the paint. But he's just to look at, he's not gonna be a, any part of anybody's life. Small cowboy boots, a quarter again beside it. And another cowboy boot and still another cowboy boot. And then on this section right here, at the, this is the first time at the Niagara show that year is when I showed off my first carvings of the branch people. And these are a branch off a tree, some in the backyard here, some in our front yard, we have big winds to take down the branches off of the Manitoba maple or the box elder tree. And uh, when they fall down, you gotta do something with them. Well, in 2017, the impact of my carving happened at Long Beach, California. I put videos on YouTube about different things. One of the things that I do is a spring pole lathe. It's one of the original lathes before the treadle lathe and before any kind of electrical power. And when Da Vinci saw the spring pole lathe, he was the one who created the treadle lathe and the, the uh, flywheel that would go on to make the thing drive in one direction. Anyway, these people contacted me. They were part of the International Wood Show which is a worldwide, if you think about the Miss World pageants, this is the Miss Wood kind of thing, or the Wood Show. Every March 21st is World Wood Day. And it's a day when they annually they celebrate wood of all different sorts. Well, that happened in Long Beach, California. My wife and I flew down and we stayed on the Queen Mary ship, the one that was built in 1936, is still floating, but it's tied up to the side of the the docks and uh, it's part of a, a hotel uh, operation on the Long Beach area. We stayed on that for 10 days. <clears throat> but while it was there, the unique thing happened is that they had brought wood carvers and wood turners and furniture makers, coffin makers, a whole bunch of people from the wood world. And as a result of that, I met some really interesting people fascinating people, tremendously craft, uh, craftsmen that were, that would just blow your mind with the kind of thing that they did. This is where I experienced uh, Hartmut Redman. He's from Germany and he had a display of his people, the small people carvings, which were on the end of a branch. And after seeing that, something inside of me came alive. His carving stirred me and that from then on, every time I picked up a branch, a piece of wood, or I cut wood down from some of our trees, each branch had a possibility in it when I started doing some of the work. And uh, to see more of his work, if you look at that name, here's how you spell it, you can see a little bit better here, it's on his display at that the World, what is wood, world wood Day. And uh, he is a, a great, uh, he's an amazing sculptor and a wood carver. This is the first, of what I saw from him. These little people are not glued on, but they're carved on the end of a branch. You can see all different sizes and um, uh, th uh, different sizes of uh, diameter, as well as the lengths. There's one more slide here of some of his uh, close-ups. And when I took the picture, the Frito lays are in the background, helps us to see a little bit of the perspective. So the branch is about maybe an inch and a half across right there. Some are inch, uh, some are half inch a bit smaller than that. Uh, but what this man did, it kind of, it, it, it lit a fire inside of me. I said, I've got to try that. No, I just point out this because you're very unique. He's got the man leaning away over. So in some of his uh, in talks or some of the things he writes about, he discovers these characters inside the wood. And that's how I've started to talk about it, to think about it. Another display in one of his galleries in Germany of all the different pieces set up. Uh, if you can see where the uh, laser pointer is at, it is car their characters are carved inside with walls around them. Now that is something I have not yet tried, but it's quite a unique piece that he's put together there. Uh, these are these strange looking instruments or creatures are all carved from wood as well as that horn on the wall. My adventure in branch carving is picking it up and thinking about what might be in there. Every branch to me has a story. I spend time looking and holding the branch to get the sense of what's in there. Now it's a little different than some others. They have a pattern that comes out of a book or they have an idea that somebody suggested or somebody else has done. 
and then you do the rough out, the cut of it, and then you start to uh, carve it and to get it the way that you want it to look or the way that you think it should look from other people doing it. Well, as I did that, this is some of my some of my first kind of carvings this way. On the left hand side is a little bit far, further away picture. You'll see this particular right here. This is a mulberry tree in our backyard. And the mulberry's got that little blue berry on it that the birds just love in the fall. We know fall's coming when the birds come. The birds grab the mulberries off there and then sit on the fence and eat it. They go back and get another mulberry and eat more, and they eat more and the more. And then as they sit on the tree, on the, uh, the fence line, they put on the ground, plants the seeds and mulberry bushes come up and push your fence over. You got to cut them down all the time. The other place I know that they're mulberries because after they eat the berries, they fly from the backyard over our house, over top our car in the driveway and poop on the car. So everything's covered with purple. It's quite an interesting adventure with carving and with birds. <laughs> now, as you look at this side here, this, this small guy down at the bottom, this is over here, the size of it. The mulberry tree is interesting because as I cut it, it was all basically one color. I carved it when it was relatively still green, having their canes on each man in that center part. And you see some of the center parts on this man's face. When the thing dried out, it turned dark brown. So now when I take my mulberry trees, the branches and stuff that I have, I then plan that happening again. And the other point I'll just point out with this slide is that this uh, picture is that these are on different levels, some tall, some short. And it adds to the display. As I looked at what Hartman was doing, these are uh, more recent pictures that I've taken in a blue background. Uh, this character has a cane. He's holding a hat. He's got kind of a banner on his shirt, uh, like his, uh, at least it's not a banner, it's the vest that he's wearing. I couldn't get close enough with this camera picture to take you, but he's got a shirt tie, and on the back, there are tails on his coat. Over here, this is a bit smaller, a barrel sitting beside him, and on this one here is a man walking with his staff and his dog beside him. Now, as I go a bit further, you can see the size. So a little fellow I'm holding with my hand, you can see the character here with the, the canes and their walking sticks. Now I come to this one and I point to the slide because in my carving, I try to, at every carving that I make, is to have a story there. Something that that carving is doing. He's not just standing there. He's not rigid. He's not a two by two by four inch block with the corners rounded off, but it's something that this guy is doing. Now this guy has his hat in his hand, a walking stick he's holding, and he's taking a step. I think on the right hand side, you could probably see uh, some of that step as his foot's raised up there a little bit. Now we go along a little bit further. And now what I'm gonna ask you to do, if you're sitting at your desk or you're close to it, just give you a moment, could you get yourself a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen? I'm going to have you do some activities with me. In every kind of presentation, there's uh, the uh, there's four words that kind of stand out in my mind is hook, book, look, took. Hook, book, look, took. So the hook is trying to grab a hold of your attention to keep it. The book is to tell you something about what I'm doing and how I do it. Hook, book, look is how you participate and take and do something that you'll never forget. And took is what you take out of here and able to do your own kind of carvings and maybe add some of these ideas to it. So what we're gonna do, when some of you say, well, I can't even draw a stick man. Well, I wanna prove that you can. So right now, I'm just gonna stop the share. You can see that character on the screen. I'm taking a, a Sharpie marker here and going to ask you to draw the same kind of thick pictures and maybe I'll have a show and tell towards the end to see how your your artwork is everybody willing to do that okay traditionally we draw a circle we put one stick down two sticks left and right and a stick arms and man if you're really fancy you could put a hand on him in an oblong shape for his feet that's simple enough to do. Give it a try.
But you see, stick men are just like us. They don't like to stay stationary. So I'm going to draw this stick man just a little different. I'm going to put a body at a bit of an angle. And then another line here, another line here, and this oblong shape is that. But then you can see as I'm starting to do that, there's already a story coming out of that. This man's moving. Okay, then if he's really running fast, one arm's back here and he's going like fire. Way it goes. Well, let's try another one. Stick man the other way. Doing some sort of aerobic, just turn him upside down. Now, when you're doing stick people, stick people don't just have to be the one kind of stick, but there's something that happens, and I guess as a, a carver and also as an artist, one thing I do is I watch people. And we're, we're the, one of the best places I find in Peterborough to watch is to when we had the opportunity, we still were uh, open. You go to the food court and watch people. Watch them sit and drinking their coffee and then watch them get up slowly because basically in my world, when you drink coffee in a food court during the week, it's filled with old people. At one point in my life, I took my gerontology studies and one lady said, well, what are you studying, Murray? And I said, well, I'm studying gerontology. And she said, well, what is that? I said, it's a study of the aging process. She looked at me, she says, honey, you don't have to study that. It'll happen without you studying it. At 77, I found out it's true. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do is stick man. It's a little different. I put the head this way. I make it an oval. He's kind of turned his head sideways. And then I'm going to put an angle line here. And I'm going to put the stick's got a bend in it. And down at the bottom, those two legs are bent a little bit. And right away, I hope you can see that this character has a cane. And age happens to all of us. Now, also what I watched, watched happening in the food courts is there are other kind of stick people that are kind of interesting. So I'm going to draw the basic stick person. And as I draw this basic stick person standing like this, and to put the arms out here a little bit further and a little bit further, when you add mass to it, some body mass, you simply come down here and exaggerate. In the caricature carving world, one thing you have to do is have a sense of humor. And the other part of it is when you're doing that, you will laugh at yourself when you see these different characters and different people that come around you. So as we do that, just exaggerate. Now, I'd ask you to try drawing a character yourself right now and see if you could have a man, a character picking something up on this side of the paper. What would he look like if he's picking something up? He could be younger because the older fellow is not gonna bend down the same way, but what happens when he does that action of picking something up? Just visualize on the, wait, no, first off, it's gonna need a head. Probably not as high as the other people's heads, but down lower. And then I put his back up and put two legs, and I don't really stand straight-legged that way, but I'll have my legs down like this and my arms come like this, and the other arm will come over here like this to pick something up. So what's happening is that you have not just a stick man, but you have some action and some motion. You have things that are happening in that uh, picture. Now, as I do that, I'm going to go back right now to uh, just one more thing, I think, the share here. And oh, we'll wait on that one. I'll do that in just a moment. We'll get uh, stop this share and come back to this part. As I come to this uh, part, looking at the, the stick persons, they, they do different things for us. They show the story. 
I'm going to go to another part of the PowerPoint right now, if I get just the right one. We're going to look a little bit further into it. This Going back to the slide again and see the action or the motion or the story. For some reason, he's taking his hat off. He's hot. He's tired. But he's still walking. More story to be told. From a block or a branch to a people, I have the word PAMS there, P-A-M-S. For me, my carving has to have some sort of posture, not just standing straight, not just standing with his arms out beside him like this, but posture is an important part to show people what you're thinking about that carving, what it's doing. Now, attitude is not only the mental attitude, but it's the attitude of the body shape and the way this is bent over, the way this is uh, moving sideways or running. And that's also closely linked to motion. You wonder how you can do that when you have a, uh, a block of wood. How does it make it look like motion? Well, you're the carver and the creator. And if you think about using the stick people, it'll help you. The other part, when I look for a carving, you look at a carving and, uh, and judge it even, when I'm looking at somebody, I try not to judge everybody's carvings, but I do judge everything I see. I take a look at it, say, what is this person trying to say? What's he trying to do? What's the story behind it? Often at the carving shows, when I walk around with my camera to take pictures for our uh, OWCA magazine, it, the neat part of it is the guy sitting at the table or gal sitting at the table, I said, tell me the story about this one. And right away, the story will come out. There's a reason why they carved it. There's somebody they thought of or some person they knew or they carved it for somebody as a gift or something they just liked. But what is this carving trying to tell me? If those words are shared with me verbally, then how do we get this point of the story? Let's give it a try. We'll go a little bit further. You have another piece of paper. <clears throat> I want you to meet Mr. and Mrs. Stick. Two stick people that are a little different than the stick man. <clears throat> so I'm going to build a reference sheet for my <clears throat> Mr. Stick. And as I do that, I'm going to start on the left-hand side asking you to do the same thing if you'd like to draw along with me or to try to build your own reference. I'm going to draw a head that is egg shape. Well, the egg is upside down in my terms. Putting a line down the middle helps me to see where the center part is and about halfway up the head, a line, a bit of a curved line across the face where the eyes would go. Now I'm going to change that position of the head a little bit for reference and I'm going to see the same egg shape only Turn it slightly and turning it just a little bit. So his jaw comes down this way. And the turn, especially because you can see it better when you put the line in the center of the head and then the eye lines this way. So the head's turned just slightly. I'm going to try to draw the head the other way. And the jawline, the bottom of the egg would be pointing this way. And this guy's not only turned the other way, but he's also kind of looking up. So the eye line would come across this way, the position on the head. I can shake and shake the same uh, head and turn it sideways completely. The egg shape is this way. And as you put the line down of it, it looks more like he's laying on his back or he's looking up. So the head could be changed in a number of different directions. Now, the next part of the uh, Mr. Stick, the very important part of the uh, torso or the abdomen part. And where I'm coming down here at this point, I'm gonna draw a shape that's kind of rounded at the top like this. And as it comes down, tapers in a little bit, comes to the bottom, doesn't make a complete egg shape, but then it has a V up the center. So in some ways it looks like a set of lungs. Put the line down the center again. 
Now this guy, he's turned just a little bit. So the round top of the uh, chest is rounded the same way, comes down the same way, tapers a bit to the right and down here now. The difference will come when his he's turned his body so you see the line of the head up here this way. The line shifts from the center over a bit to the right and then the V comes up this way, this portion being smaller than this portion. So the body's turning. Now we're gonna try uh, the uh, torso, the body shape for this side. And I'm going to go around this way, turn just a bit, rounded at the top, come around to the bottom, and then the V up here. And this again turns a bit to the left. Now, if he's laying down in the, the body, of course, he's almost on his back at this stage. Uh, the uh, heart shape or, or the egg shape body parts are gonna be this way. And of course, he's laying more on his back. So the center part would come this way in a smaller portion to that side of the section of the body. Now over here, drawing this, uh, the tor uh, uh, part of the uh, torso, the pelvic area, is the bean shape. Drawing by hand is much uh, slower in some ways because the computer just doesn't zip when you draw on it. And I'm putting on a touch legs to it this way. And then put the two spots on each side of the, the pelvis. And the legs would come down like this. The dots represent the joints. Now turning the body a little bit that way, I'll take the same bean shape and turn it a bit on the side, just a little bit. The leg would be fastened here. The center line is also changed there and the leg comes down this way. You can't see the hip joint on the other side. So it's represented by a line about here. We'll give him a set of knees also. Now this character, the beam is changed the other direction. Almost the same, you can just uh, change a little bit of the size to make it look like it's uh, turned some. And again, the line would go this way in the center. Leg would be attached here and here. Now, of course, this one, he's laying on his back. So the beam shape is going to be a little bit shorter and almost round. Again, the same idea. So because he's down lower, his leg would be this way. And perhaps even this way laying on the back, you can change and put the knees down here and put feet on it. Now the side view is one thing that come up here, changes just, it changes quite a bit. And then I'm going to put a head uh, the egg shape is now changing slightly in that it has the profile and there's no, no center line. But what I do have is the, the line on the side of the head where the eyes would go and possibly nose later on. Now, as I'd have the chest drawn sidewise, the side the profile view, it'll be a little different shape and it stands out there and it tapers in at the bottom and around this way, but it has no center line showing because it's on the side. And of course the pelvis then is a bean shape would be simply round. And as you have the hip connection to that, the legs usually couldn't stand absolutely straight, have to be a little bit of a bend in it this way in order to make it look more natural in the pose. Now, one thing I should come back here now and just to illustrate this, what I'm going to do is if I fasten arms to this body, I would have a neck here, not quite so long as this, but I'll have the shoulder coming out this way and this way, and it represented with the shoulder joints and then the arms come down from there. Now in this character here, a neck would be coming up. I can't do it quite that long to make it natural. But the shoulder would come over a little shorter line 
a little shorter line there and his arms here and there. And of course, on this one here, shoulders here, and it doesn't quite show all of it there. It's over here and here. On this, uh, the, uh, on his back, the neck would be up like this and shoulder coming down, shoulder going up a bit, and you'll see less of the arm that way. It would be something of that sort. And then on this side, of course, you don't see, you'll see the neck, but it won't be that long. Uh, it'll have to be not straight up and down, that's standing like a soldier, but the neck would be a bit of an angle. On an older person, I'll show you in just a few moments how that looks, the changes in position and so on there. So the, the pelvis is then connected with the backbone like this. And just to make him, so I can have better thoughts about him, he'll have two legs, not just one. So that's a bit of building a reference. And one of the things to do is simply keep drawing these until you feel comfortable with them. When I go to draw, I go to uh, start to design or make a, a carving, I'll use this kind of method of my stick man to get the positions and shape, the attitude, the motion in, that I want for my carving. And then as I put this together, one thing I can do, and maybe you can just illustrate that here, is I can start to build on that body some flesh and some mass. So I come over here to this shoulder, and if he's muscular, he'd have an arm like that, a little bit of a muscle down here, that way there, and it attaches to the torso here. So it's just a matter of putting skin and muscle onto the bone. So right away, my character is starting to uh, come to life a little bit more. I'd like to show you, if you'd like to take a moment just to draw some of these, how about a stick person with some form? You'll see the guy on the left is standing nice and straight and tall. Shoulders are up. His hands on his hip. He's expecting for an answer for his question. The person second from the left has his hands down, kind of an expectation. Not sure how to react to what's happening just up ahead, but he's ready to do something. The third person, second from the right, his hands are behind him a little bit, and you can see the chest is somewhat different. In the first two, you'll see the line in the middle of the chest kind of indicates which way the body is turned. And the third person, it's a, it's a profile, and the chest is up high, tapers down towards the center, and then you have the round circle for the hip. It's not a bean shape anymore. It's just round. And as you look at the legs, it goes, the, the thigh goes down almost straight, and then the calf goes a bit to the back. And one of the ways in illustrating that in the, uh, the stick person, that helps you just kind of uh, fill in the gaps. The eyes tend to fill in what is not there. One is the calf of the leg. Now, the person on the right definitely is going somewhere, taking lighter steps. Did you have a chance to draw all of those? You can even do a screenshot on your computer if you wanted to press the uh, screenshot and you'll get a shot of it right away to keep it there and put it into a file. Now I go to the next one and these are different kinds of actions. The ones on the right hand side, the three that are there are really my female forms that I have uh, created. Now they're not drawn just by hand. I use the computer to help me draw that. Uh, draw a line a little bit straighter sometimes and uh, when it gets far enough away you don't see all the little mistakes but one of the things about this person second from the left is a woman standing on her tiptoes and with her hand up calling somebody here she's walking almost like there was in the other picture here really walking somewhere quickly now i haven't put the breasts on her or accentuated any parts of her body to indicate she's a woman but still you can see the female body is somewhat different. Now, on this one, on the left-hand side, what I've done is showing the body staying straight up. It's the same picture as from before of the man standing with his shoulders up. Second from the left is the same man as he's aged about 50 years. His shoulders are down. His legs are no longer strutting apart left and right standing at attention, kind of demanding and asking what's going on here. 
The second for the person on the left is wondering what's going on. The chest is a lot bigger. And if you're to put flesh on that, he's going to have a tummy. Third from the right, or second from the right, I should say, is the man standing profile again with his chest is up. On the right hand side, you'll see the person's chest has fallen. And usually the head on a more senior person is further ahead and the head's lowered somewhat. As the person gets really old, that will even happen more, be more accentuated than this. And you'll see that the chest has fallen. One of the jokes that we used to tell about each other is you got furniture problems. What do you mean I got furniture problems? Well, your chest is in your drawers. It's as simple as that. Makes sense, doesn't it? You get this age. And again, to make him look old, both legs are bent just a little bit, not standing straight anymore. But he's also got a cane. So adding those little features to it help to um, provide that uh, special look to him. Now, what I'm doing over here on this, these pictures are more drawings of how uh, you put the flesh onto that stick person. So if you were to take one of the stick people you, you drew just now and the story that was in that stick person, add the muscle, the tone, the shape of the body, the flesh that's on that stick person, and basically you'll come off with these kind of pictures doing different things. Now, I know that in character carving, a lot of people will use, uh, will have used or do use the, the uh, uh, clay modeling. And basically, this is the same idea. Now, I don't use clay modeling. I do drawing because that's my thing. As an artist, I don't have a problem drawing it. But it certainly will help those that need to visualize further to do your character with clay. And uh, building, an, uh, we're going to talk about that, or at least uh, Mark Sheridan and his guys are going to be talking about that further in the True North session that they're going to be talking about character driving. I uh, go to the next slide. It shows a woman. Again, some of the poses are more traditional. It's not the way a man would stand. It's the way the woman would stand. And her body is filled out a whole lot more. But the uh, part about carving the woman, and you want to be very careful if uh, you're doing this, I've had people come up to my carving table and say, you're making fun of this person. I said, no, it's something I saw and I simply am drawing it the way and, and creating carving it the way I saw. So sometimes when I do, most everything I do is something to do with uh, funny. It's a cartoon. It's a caricature that'll make people laugh. So I accentuate certain parts of the body. Now, I just go a little bit further in this part of the talk is, I've admired the typical African carvings, you know, the elephant and the giraffe and different kinds of carvings like monkeys and that kind of thing. But in 2007, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Nairobi uh, and to Kenya. And while we're in Nairobi in the center of Kenya, we also went over to Mombasa for part of the, uh, it was a Canadian uh, retreat that I was there to, to be the facilitator of the speaker at the thing. And as Mombasa's on the coast, coast of Kenya, Mombasa was taken, when we were there, we were taken to a carving village, a place that was a whole row of great big trees, lots of shade, but they also had tarps under there in case some, it rained. And they were not doing, they were doing the typical animals and for the tourists that come by. And there was a store nearby that sold everything that these fellows were carving. And well, on the internet in recent times, I published this on our magazine, a young fellow by the name of Daniel, and he describes himself as a single man born in uh, September in a part of the uh, eastern region of Ghana. I'm chocolate in complexion. And he likes singing and drawing, playing of soccer, carving, and finally sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I'm a retired minister, so that kind of caught my eye. <laughs> I was interested to talk to Daniel by way of the computer and been uh, almost conversing with him about every second or third day. He writes to me and shows me what he's just recently carved. I have a toolbox that absolutely fills with tools. Some people claim that I'm Tim the tool man, number two. I have the Binford 5,000 this and the Binford 6,000 that and something just a little bit bigger and the better. And when something comes up that I would like and want, I will make arrangements for me to get that like and want into my case. You'll notice at the bottom, Daniel's main tool is an X-Acto knife. 
that kind of made me ashamed of what I was doing in some ways, but in some ways I don't use a lot of tools. Now, <clears throat> recently he published this on his Facebook page. <clears throat> on the left is the photograph that the, the, the gal has sent to him of her husband giving her a big hug and you'll see her hand up with a V symbol. It's not a very good photograph the way it's taken, but you can see the V symbol there. That's the only picture he had. And on the right-hand side of the, of the slide, you can see he's carved these people and notice his fingers down below, that's how big they are. And that the picture is not quite that big, but I guess that's something that happens when you're carving with all of us too. These are the back scenes and she, he didn't have a, a picture of that. And uh, you can see as he's holding the thing and on the right-hand side is the silhouette of the same um, carving. Now, in a nutshell, I come to another part just before Christmas, we were having nuts and stuff around our home. Well, walnuts were part of it. I took the nutshell, cleaned it up a bit, and on the back side of the hinge is made out of a, the edge of a terry towel, of an old bath towel that's in my shop. I cut the edge off and uh, put uh, glue, well, the crazy glue kind of thing, actually Gorilla Glue's uh, gel glue on the back of it, and it sticks real good and provides a great hinge. The little houses, my first tree is carved on the left-hand side, the second is in the middle. That was kind of an adventure. On the right-hand side picture, there's a picture of a house in snow with evergreens and the smallest carving I ever did of an outhouse. To one more slide, I love the Vikings. It's a great TV program. And as I did that, I thought, what about putting, I didn't have the top of the shell actually because it broke when it took it apart, but I made up a Viking uh, crew there's five Vikings rowing on each side. I give them each a horned helmet, as well as the guy at the back. You can see he's got a hatchet up in the air. It's a little crude, a little rough carving, but it gets difficult to do to keep it that in proportion in there. The dragon has a wood burning done on it first, then gold paint applied to it, and it becomes my Viking carving. As I go into further, I did quite a few now with different kind of creatures inside looking out when people open it up. Santa Claus is in the middle and on the right is snowman. And that is also the smallest carving I did where the noses of the snowman are actually carved carrots. Now, we all love to experience small from an early age. And I think everybody that comes by your table at a carving show has that same kind of experience. You may be with your kids and be with your kids when this happened or your grandkids, but do you remember this picture? This will flash up some memories from a way back. It's got to have sort of a flute music in the background. It comes down to the picture of the right, the friendly giant, and slowly the drawbridge comes down and then the doors open up to this here. Do you remember this picture top left-hand side? It was all about miniatures. And our love for miniatures in that little kind of scene there's Friendly in the bottom right picture and his friend Rusty with that weird voice. Now I'm going a little bit further. When we lived in Asia, in Hong Kong particularly, and traveled somewhat in China, different parts of Asia, I found these carvings, look, I saw them at least in the, in the, villa, in the stores where tourists would be a lot of in the different districts, the Netsuki. And originally they were started, they started to appear, at least they have now collected some from the 17th century, that would be the 1600s. And these little characters were carved out of ivory. Today they're carved out of taigua nut because ivory is not allowed any longer. But the little characters are carved out of ivory and then they would have one or two holes in it where a sash would go through it and it became a button for the kimono that people wore. So there's all different kinds of characters. Now you wonder what in the world people, these are ones that people are buying. I actually got them off of a um, auction site from Britain. And uh, these sell for around 17,000 to 23,000 Canadian dollars per carving. Now in business, I don't think I'll ever get to that, but I, I love the idea and the things that they show in the stories that are being told in every one of the carvings that they have. Top left hand side, you see the mouse giving the turtle a ride or taking him somewhere. And on the right side, the, the shell is cracking with the turtle coming out of it. It's a fascinating part of uh, miniature carving. 
So as I come down to getting close to the end of what I'm going to share today is that the uh, my favorite tools really are these right here is what I've used to carve most of my miniatures. Um, in the center, there's the two um, knives that uh, came to me by way of uh, George Warner here locally in Peterborough. And uh, on the left hand side, these two blades the two knives are the um, holders that hold scalpel blades. Uh, Lee Valley sells these. Mine are so old and so worn now that it goes back to the time when these were designed. They had the left one has, if you look at the bottom, a knurled knob on it. That knurled knob has a, a, a uh, magnet on it to hold extra blades in. So it's something like an exacto knife. You turn the knurled brass piece at the top, opens the chuck up, and you put a new blade in. Blades are very, very cheap to use and very to, to buy. And uh, they do a great job. They carve well. And uh, here, the two knives are oh, at least the uh, palm chisels on that and one riffler on the right-hand side, second from the, the right. You'll show that. Uh, it shows there what we're doing on that part. Now, I'm going to stop this share right here and come to and back to another screen. Perhaps it'll help us to see. I'll show you just a quick video of uh, what I have done in this area. I hope you can see that. If it was on my side, it's miniaturized still, but uh, maybe it'll be big enough for you to at least see it. I make five cuts on the end of the branch if I'm going to carve two people. And the depth of that cut helps me decide or helps me to make the height of the people. And after those cuts are made, then with the chisel, you cut the rest off or you saw them off, it'll come loose and I have the, enough for two people there. Now on the slide, on the video, so you take the pencil and I draw the, the, the shape of the head and the way I want it to be. Now I want this man on the left-hand side of this drawing, or on the part that I'm drawing right now, will be talking to the other person on the right. That's part of my story. So as I begin to carve this, I fast forwarded quite quickly on a not to show you every cut. I did one that's quite long. It's almost an hour long for every cut being made. But uh, sometimes I think Mark shared and I shared together that when you're trying to carve and videotape at the same time, you tend to carve and think about it, but then you go off screen or off camera. It makes a bit of a problem. So I'm creating his head here at this point. And as I get the head more or less situated in the right spot, get the shape of it, I start working on the back. And then I'll go to the bottom and take off more material. After I get that off, I'm going to go to the bottom of it and then start working on the, sh the place where I want his legs to be. So. Basically, his body is going to be shaped uh, facing diagonally across the, the wood, across the stick. And as you draw the line on it, then you'll start to carve in deeper a little bit at a time. Now, I'm going to go a little bit quicker here and fast forward just a bit more. Carving keeps going on. You'll see my hands drawing pictures and pieces. As I lay out, the arm is another area that I'll start to carve and cut in. And his arm will be holding a cane or his walking stick, the cuts that are making. Now, one thing that I make really no apologies for, I started carving when I was about seven. I'm 77 now. I tried to use a glove to be obedient and stick with the rest of the carvers. And I found it the most clumsy thing that I'd ever worked with in my life. So I stopped that and been very careful how I carve and I don't cut myself. So far, it's been that way. Now starting to cut through on the legs on this, this creature and character. As I go a bit further, then he's just about done. But what I don't worry about is the centerpiece between the two characters. At this part stage, I can't possibly carve in there where there's no tools that I have that help me to do that. So I just leave it alone until I get the other character just about carved and I can then carve the right side and left side of both of those men to be able to uh, finish up the carving better. Now this is, I'm looking at it closer, starting on the, uh, the, his friend that he's going to talk to, the head first. And as I carve more of it, I'm going to fast forward to go, so it won't bore you to death on that part. They come down close to the end and there the fellows are. So as I hold it up now, possibly right there, there it is. So that's my very short video of my carvings. I'm going, to, I'm going to stop at this point to ask you if you've got any questions.
Perhaps I can answer some of them or help you in that way, but uh, any comments? You can turn your mic back on. I'd love to hear you. Do you use any, Murray, it's Bob Robertson here. Okay. Uh, do you use any special tools for hardwoods? Like I'm, I'm trying to carve in um, uh, purple heartwood and it's, it's a challenge with uh, just with knives and gouges. Yeah. Similarly with maple too. So I, I alternate between knives and gouges and uh, power tools. I think my hardest ones that I've gone to, believe it or not, is that mulberry. When it's green, it's soft, but when it's uh, dried out, it's as hard as a rock. And so I carve very carefully one small chip at a time, basically using those uh, uh, GW knives with the handles there. You saw them in the two in the middle. And yeah. I go carve very, very carefully. And I've carved some oak, but I found it uh, it has such a change in grain that I don't I can't predict what's going to happen. So I wanted more of a clear green. I've never carved purple heart. I've done some work with it in flat. I love the color of it, but that's about as much as I can share on that. Okay, thanks. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, I carve the, um, I use purple heart quite often too for my little birds. And you can't use knives and chisels on it. So I have a Yeshwan and I, uh, the Gesh one that I have is like the dentist drill and it has all these attachments. And so you're able to uh, use your power tools to do that. Trying to use the knife and chisels on Purple Heart is really, really hard. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Lou. Gesh one, that's a brand of uh, a rotary tool. Yeah, Gashwin is the most expensive carving tool. At the time when I bought it, it was uh, $2,300. Yeah. Okay. But That's probably why I don't have one. I have it, I've had it 20 years and it's still going. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've had it fixed a few times. Mike Shepard is the guy who fixes things for us. He's fixed it a few times, but it's still working after all these years. Great. It's uh, Eric here. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way of, when you're buying basswood, of determining without cutting into it, <laughs> whether it's going to be a good, relatively soft basswood. Because I've got a piece from my son. I'm trying to carve a little, a little fellow. And gosh, is, is it hard to, to carve? It's, it's quite a, a hard basswood. Any way of determining when you're, you're buying it from a from a dealer or a lumber place? Yeah, I found that too. Some of the basswoods are very, very hard. And I think it's probably the hardwood family as well, but it's a soft kind of wood most of the time. And when you carve it, if you, uh, if when you get a chance to check it out ahead of time, just be careful what you decide to carve if it's real hard. It's gonna take a long time. Yeah. You get I lots of good detail with a hard piece of basswood though. Yeah. I found with the basswood, Murray, if you look at it very closely, if it's a lighter color, it's easier to carve. And the darker color is harder to carve. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Richard here. Um, what do you do to finish your little people? I mean, it's nice to carve them like that, but um, don't you do something to preserve it for everybody to see? Uh, if I want a natural finish on it, that I'll do the spray lacquer. The lacquer that I use, I found that I went looking for this mainly because I want to buy it locally. I haven't ordered much online like that, but the lacquer is uh, Rust-Oleum from uh, either Home Depot or Home Hardware has this Rust-Oleum products for the things that if you remember, that's the product that they designed to spray outdoor chairs with and for your deck chairs, that type of thing after a use. Well, the Rust-Oleum has a Rust-Oleum 2X. It's a white colored can and white with a different, I think a clear top on it. And it's one is a gloss finish, one is a semi-gloss and one is a matte. They're about $10 for each can, but it dries in 10 seconds which is absolutely blow your mind. It's, it's a real good product that way. 
what I do on my carvings, most of these smaller ones, I use the, uh, um, just the, like at Michael's or the craft stores, I buy the small uh, one or $2 size uh, containers. They'll last me for a long time. And I uh, will thin it out somewhat on the wood if I need the wood to show through. But otherwise I put it on fairly thick, let it dry fairly good. And when you put the, a couple of puffs of that Rust-Oleum 2X onto it, it fastens it, fixes it right away. Now, if I happen to use uh, uh, the markers, like uh, these uh, Sharpie markers to do some coloring on it, uh, you can't do that with the, the Rust-Oleum stuff, the puffs, you go onto it, it'll actually dissolve the marker and make it run. Recently, I did uh, some hippies and I wanted to look, wanted their outfits to look like tie dye. So I did put the markers on first and then uh, sprayed the lacquer on it and it bled into each other, making a perfect tie dye on a piece of wood. It worked really good. So I'm not sure if that hel helps you or not. Often with the natural finish, I'll just simply oil it. I have at the end of oiling, if it's gonna be a real shiny piece, I'll put wax on it, but most of the caricatures are not shiny. They're a dull finish. I have to concentrate more before of uh, actually putting paint on is trying to get the fluff and little edges off. So when you look at some of my carvings, the pieces that are up close definitely are uh, rough. They're not sanded right down. I use a riffler on it, the little files to get some of those pieces off, but uh, and sometimes I just don't take the time to do it, but I'm not putting them in a competition, so I will lose out. I don't know if that helps you or not, does it? Yes, it helps, but you said you use oil. Uh, can you give it a little more information? And what is it that you use from Michaels? <clears throat> Michaels are those little uh, craft, uh, they're about, I know there's a whole row of them. They got a whole shelf full of hundreds and hundreds of color. It's a craft color, watercolor. And they have some metallic colors and that kind of thing that work just great for making, especially fairy houses. That's when I started using that. The oil is just a, a different oils that I have, like the uh, Danish oils are one kind that will seal the wool up wood re really well. Uh, but it's, uh, there's just a big variety. I can probably email it better when I give you, uh, if you want to contact me that way, and I'll send some information for you that way. Do you use acrylic paints? I don't use acrylic paint, but I know that some others do. Like Mark Sheridan might jump in here now and help me on that and tell me a little bit about what you use on some of your uh, caricatures. Actually, Murray, when you were describing what you pick up at Michael's, those were probably or could likely have been the acrylic paint. So they're, they're a water-based paint. Uh, the acrylic just means that it has uh, an additive in it that makes a really strong chemical bond when it hardens. And so, uh, you know, when you buy uh, latex paint and you paint your, your living room or something and it says that it's scrubbable, that means it's an acrylic paint. You can, after 30 days when it's fully cured and that chemical bond has been set, you can scrub it and you won't take the paint off. So it just makes the paint really hard. Almost competitive with the, well, probably more competitive uh, than the oil paints we may have used in the 60s and 70s. I think, Mark, one of the things that uh, we do, uh, I do a lot of it when I'm doing some of the faces and the flesh tones, that kind of thing, I'm using a combination of colors, a certain base color, and then you build it up with lighter colors on top of it. So uh, one of the things about this paint is that you can uh, dip your brush in water and get it a little bit wet and it'll put a, a thinner coat of paint onto the surface. But in the same way, also, if I use a brush and dry it off and dip it in the paint and then rub that brush onto a piece of uh, like a tissue or a, another surface and I do a dry brush effect and dry brush the color on over top so you don't put as much, it doesn't bleed out. It goes just where the bristles are. Anyone else folks? Uh, Murray, I was, um, I was with somebody else and I can't remember who it was, but when you get into some harder wood or even basswood, some sections will be hard and some sections will be small, be, be uh, um, easier to carve. 
what they told me to do is mix a half and half with alcohol and water and put it in a spray bottle and spray it. Yeah. And then that makes that surface a lot easier to carve. That's for sure. Yeah. I just, cause somebody was saying they were having another question I have, does basswood, as it gets old, like let's say it's been sitting around for 10 or 15 years, it get harder. I'm not sure. No, I haven't seen that. I can answer that. Uh, if, if you have some old uh, basswood, it, it does get harder as years go by. When I get basswood, I try and buy the whitest basswood that you can find. And I buy it in uh, like four inches wide by nine or 10 inches by 10 feet long. And that, that'll last me for a couple of years. And at the end of the two years, you can tell that it's a little bit harder, but not a whole bunch. I've been given wood that people have said, oh yeah, I've had it for two or three years. And you talk to somebody else. Oh yeah, I gave that to Bob eight years ago. <laughs> and it, virtually you cannot carve it. It's just terrible. <clears throat> Another thing to look for when, you, when you're buying basswood, if you, if you see some basswood and it feels light, but it, it looks like uh, you can see the, the stain in it. It's kind of a yellowish. That's sap. That means it was cut down in the summertime, whereas a winter cut tree will be no sap, thus it'll be whiter. Oh. Did that help you? Yeah, that's great. Good. I cut down a tree this summer because uh, it was falling down anyway. And I didn't know what it was. And I, I took the leaf and I photographed it. Then I went on the website for uh, Guelph University and I found out it was cottonwood. And it's really, it's very close to basswood. Mm -hmm. um, and I've carved some things out of it. But I was told that cottonwood don't grow up in the northern part of Canada. I'm talking about up around Perry Sound area. Yeah. But that's what it looks like to me. What did the bark look like? Very coarse, very deep. Um, well, then that would put it in the cottonwood family then. So they do grow up here. I've never seen them up this way. Oh. Well, I, like I said, I photographed the leaf and I, and, I, and I went to the university and I found <laughs> cottonwood and it was identical. So I'm thinking, because I thought basswood usually has a bigger leaf. It's, I don't know, it three or four inches. It's quite a big leaf. Whereas cottonwood is all jagged all around the edges and it's not very big. It's maybe two inches, two and a half inches wide. Mm. This, so, this, anyway, is Ken, I, this is Ken. Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. I understand that the poplar tree and the cottonwood are in the same family. And you may be looking at poplar wood, which is oh, quite yeah. soft. It's easy yeah. to carve. Oh, okay. I don't know about the poplar tree we have here. We have the black poplar, they call it. And it grows to 150 feet high or higher, straight up. And when the branches break off in a big storm, it takes the shed out, the fence off, the back porch off. It's a nightmare tree when it gets that big. But you're talking about six to $7,000 to take down one of those trees. So that's why people just let them grow and then sell the house. Yeah. <laughs> one thing I just asked we've got uh, 29 people who joined us and some of you folks come in a little bit later when I said this but if you could go to the bottom of your zoom screen to the left of the green share screen button and you'll find the chat word if you can simply write your name in the chat after you click on the button you'll see a place to the right hand side where you can type your name in and where you come from it's kind of like an attendance we take we're really happy to have each one of you here. It's been delightful to have you here tonight and be a part of this. I hope you've got something from it. Now, anybody else got a question or a suggestion? I think it's great how you're able to answer somebody's question here tonight. Um, just, just to get back to the um, cottonwood. I, there is cottonwood in this part of the country. Very little. I've run across uh, the odd tree and always along very close to water. Along, along the shore. Now the cottonwood here is, is not the same as the cottonwood from out west. I, I love doing cottonwood bark carvings. 
-hmm. And the, 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 the bark from out west is very deep. You can get it up to four or five inches uh, thick, while the uh, cottonwood bark in this area, you'll get it at, I've seen it maximum two inches. There's still something in there to do, um, to do fairly nice carvings, but uh, there is some in this part of the country, but it do, you don't come across it very often. Yeah. Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, in the Ottawa area, there's lots of Eastern cottonwood. It's a poplar. Trembling aspen is a poplar. Uh, so all, all of these do tend to have uh, fairly soft wood. I've never worked with anything but the... Um, but the bark, I've never carved uh, the wood as such. I've used uh, 83 types of wood from around the world. My goal is to use 100 types of wood. I'm up at 83. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Mark or Marie. Um, how do you find working with Tupelo? Mark, you're up. I've only used it once, uh, Lou, yeah. and uh, could not cut it even with uh, a surgically sharp knife. Had to use a Fordham tool. Yeah. And uh, it was just a songbird that I did, Lou. And uh, okay. that was my one experience with it. Yeah, I, I never use it. I don't like that wood at all. It's, uh, it, you know, I, I, I describe it as almost like uh, kind of a feeling of cork almost. Bob yeah. Robertson, you do an awful lot of bird carving. Do you use Tupelo? I, yeah, I've used Tupelo and, and basswood. And uh, tu you're right, Tupelo, you basically have to use power tools with. Yeah. I tried uh, I, I tried a carving uh, of a, a whale's tail with, uh, in, of a Tupelo with uh, knives, and I titled it Never Again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing with the Tupelo, though, it paints nice. Yeah. It's, a, it's really good for birds, uh, but, you, but you have to use power tools with it. Yeah. And it burns nicely and, yep. I wondered about that uh, myself, it's Eric here. You're looking at a magazine like a uh, uh, waterfowl magazine and it has all kinds of birds in it and they're always using some sort of power tools. I couldn't understand why. I mean, I've never tried Topello. In fact, I looked up, where do you get it? And it's not readily available in this area. It's a southern U.S. Uh, swamp type of tree that they use the bottom buttress, the thick part, to get big chunks to make their uh, waterfowl carvings and so on. So it, you've answered my question. <laughs> you can't really carve it very well. So they use it's, power tools. It, it's Thank certainly you. nice with the Fordham tool because it's almost grainless, Eric. It's, yeah, it almost yeah. has no grain at all and you can go no. in any direction you want to put the finest of detail. But as yeah. Bob was saying, it's just a pain in the neck if you ever wanted to take a knife to it. It has to be completely done with, uh, with power tools. Yeah. Glad to know that. <laughs> One person mentioned that uh, the trees that grow often beside the waterways, uh, somebody gave me a piece of wood, another carver said, here, you have this, you can try it. He's, I said, what is it? It's a, it was about three inches thick and um, 18 inches wide and maybe 12 inches high. Nice big chunk of wood and the, the live edge, what they call it now, it was on the edge of it. And I had never seen this kind of wood. It kind of looked like cedar, but he said it was willow. I said, what kind? What do you mean willow? He said, it's called swamp willow. I said, what's swamp willow? I never heard of it. He said, you'll find out. So I laid out my buck and two does just coming out of the edge of the, of the bush and uh, looking around, and it, it carves really good. But the problem is every time you cut it and do a fresh level of cutting, it smells like vomit. Oh dear. And it's one of the most foul woods I've ever been close to. It doesn't have a nice cedar smell. That's why I was waiting to see if it was cedar or not. But what had happened actually, when they give it the word swamp willow, or you know, the, it, it has grown beside a waterway that's stagnant. And it simply sucked up everything that's in that particular puddle. And, and there wasn't an to, handy? To smell. <laughs> and even now, I've, I've been working, I just, I, I chip away a bit once in a while, it's almost done, but 
I wait a while in between my different times, you know, a month or so here, and I go back and carve it again. And sure enough, every time I cut it, the shop starts smelling like some pretty foul things. But it's just one of those interesting things. Wood is good, but wood can surprise you. Yeah, Murray. Uh, it's also a diamond willow that grows on this in close to water. Yeah. And <laughs> I make uh, stuff, walking stuffs with it, with the diamond willow. Yeah, the wa diamond willow out west in Alberta, for instance, along the waterways of different rivers is yeah. phenomenal. It's one of the best things you'll ever get. If you ever have a holiday out there, go with it. Uh, you can't find any around here. No, it's pretty hard here. Yeah. The swamp willow that you mentioned, as a botanist, I know it as black willow. It's, it's always along riverways, uh, along the Ottawa River, Rideau River, and so on in, in the area. So it's, it's a fairly common, and it's a large tree, very rough bark. Yeah. Uh, I guess it can be reasonably thick. Uh, but it's interesting here that uh, it can smell. <laughs> I, I, I've never heard that. I'll have to look into that. One part of my life is uh, I do lace making and uh, the two particular kinds are one is totting, which is a very small kind of thing with a shuttle. And the other part was uh, bobbin lace, which is a pillow that you have pins on and pairs of bobbins hung from these pins. And the tradition is that you carve or turn the little bobbin, which is about the size of this uh, pen. It's roughly that size. In the, the old days, way back when a guy was courting his girl or a fellow was in bobbin making, they would go to the willow tree and plant pellets of iron at the base of the tree in the roots or cobalt, uh, different kind of chemicals they would pour in and around that tree. And when the tree grew up, the wood had a color of whatever that chemical was. And when they carved it or turned it, it come out just as brilliant. It, it's just amazing what it looks like. So it's something that when you're getting ready to prepare your wood, you can put something in the color that way. It's almost like staining, but the thing is sucked up the uh, chemical right through. Turning might not be such a good idea because the dust coming off it could probably kill you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody tried the weeping willow? Well, well, it's commonly been. planted. No, I haven't. Done. Any other thoughts about small carving now? Have you ever tried anything real small like I did? It's Eric here. I often go to uh, Value Village and, and to some other uh, um, antique places. And I ended up with a carving of a little sailor guy, but an inch tall and with detail and painted it's the smallest our carvers here uh, in our club have ever seen, about an inch tall, a little sailor man painted and carved, really neat. Nice. It's uh, Richard here. I have tried uh, doing some carving that's uh, five, six inches tall. And uh, after a, a great number of design changes, I end up with some small people. <laughs> I've said this before to our groups and I said that uh, art is an idea with a line around it or carving is an idea it comes with a line around it it's a place a quiet place for a loud idea but it's also one mistake covering another mistake with enough nerve to charge for it that's a deep one <laughs> Oh, it's deep, all right. <laughs> I have one here. I don't. Can you see me or see? No, it? we can't see you. But uh, if you want to be seen, you go down and touch the little uh, camera that's on the left-hand side beside the microphone. It's got a line through it. Yeah. Get once, and your your video will come on. How's that? That's got you for yeah. sure. Well, there, there's there's one that I carved a few years ago. Okay. It's two inches high. And it represents Mark Twain when he was on stage in 1899 in New York City. Uh, <laughs> I got in trouble because somebody told me he never wore dark suits. Well, in January in 1899 in New York City, he wore dark suits. But that's, <laughs> that's an example of a small, when I say small, two inches high. 
long hair and all. <laughs> <laughs> I carve uh, the boots like Murray does, but I add two mice with mine and they're very small and I insert one in the boot and my name underneath it says two mice in case one runs away. <laughs> That's the story behind your carving. Yep, that's the story <laughs> behind that carving. <clears throat> well, folks, I hope it's been a good night for you. Very good. Yeah, yeah thank you, Murray. Pick Murray, up some Murray. ideas, and uh, we're like a bunch of bees. We cross pollinate, go into different flowers, and bring back ideas and make sweet, sweet carvings out of it. <laughs>